on a case. Okay, so with that being said, uh, defense Judge. on your to-do list. Well, this morning uh, around 8.15 or 8.20, emails were sent with regards to three motions in limited that the prosecution filed. Um, I didn't see the emails until a little after 9 o'clock. Um, and to be quite candid with you, Judge, I was only able to glean over them since we were here at 9.30. And uh, we've been going on through trial. And obviously, I attempted to, to breeze through them over the lunch break, but I was assisting Mr. Padilla in preparation for his cross of Emma Loon. Um, it's my recollection, Judge, that the court provided a deadline for motions in limine. That um, motions in limine were filed by the defense and the government, and they were litigated. We have done a substantial amount of preparation, strategizing, in terms of presenting our case, the, interviewing the, the, the state witnesses, and preparing a voir dire based on what was in front of us. Now the government is asking to have the ability to have motions in limine heard three weeks into trial. Judge, I would say that given the fact that there was a cutoff date by the, by, the, by, the, by the court, that we would strike these motions as untimely. And would you also like me to strike your child hearsay motion that was filed yesterday? Well, Judge, the, the, the reason why that we filed the child hearsay motion uh, was in response to our inability to serve Mr. Vieira his his, in essence, blatant attempts to shield his child. That's not something we expected, okay? That's not something But you knew that on day two of jury selection. Correct, Judge. I mean, cor correct, but that's not a motion in limine. Okay. okay? Well, it, at this it, time, it, at this time, again, to use your famous phrase, Mr. Zagany, trial is a fluid thing. Both the state and the defense are entitled Motions have been brought up at the last minute, motions to compel, when discovery should have been completed by all deadlines, um, motions to exclude, and so forth and so on. So at this time, the court will be continuing forward with the state's motions. If I could just lay a record, Judge. You may. The, the, the court's uh, denial of my motion to strike has substantially impaired uh, the defense the fact that these substantial motions, Bruce Bates, his testimony is uh, ten uh, to, to our battered spouse defense. It buttresses our position where the uh, decedent would gloat to this her daily customer that she was the man in the relationship. She would also she, uh, uh, she also indicated that she was an avid drug user, which also uh, boasts our position in terms of of that issue. Um, and then the government has, then the state has filed motions to, to exclude or limit our expert witnesses. Um, this has detrimentally uh, uh, affected our ability to not only prepare for jury selection, but it, it, uh, we were hoping that this, this is something that we would need a direction in the inception of the case. Um, the distinction between what's occurred uh, here with regards to the state's motions and the defense motions is that uh, our motions were reacted and based on Gabriel Vieira and uh, the manner in which trial was conducted. Now I'll tell you this, Judge, we were under the impression, given the fact that this was a child, and uh, impression, Judge, this is trial strategy and trial tactic. We, we believed that they would provide Mercy Restrana uh, at, as the child advocate to play the, the, the tape of, of Isabel Vieira because they did, there was a child uh, neglect charge. When we realized that wasn't going to happen, we filed a motion. That was responsive. Nothing has changed in the state's case or position that would have prevented or precluded them from filing these motions at the inception of the case when the court had set a, a deadline. I, I understand that, as I, as I say, trial is fluid, so on and so forth, but there's been no change in circumstance for Bruce Bates' testimony and, and, the, and the, limit, the attempt by the prosecution to limit 
uh, Mr. Barsa uh, and, um, I'm sorry, uh, the two listed witnesses, the two listed experts. Uh, but, um, I'm sorry, Judge, I just have to. Address the court. That's what you need to do. Okay. With that being said, let's hear the state's motions. Judge, with respect to Mr. Bates, the, the real issue is, is mostly, that's basically a hearsay motion in, in essence, Judge, which of course the state can always object to hearsay as the witness is testifying. We really just wanted to get this issue heard because it's our position that really everything he says is hearsay and rather than having to do a sidebar, we just assume do it now. Um, Mr. Bates has a lot to say about the relationship between Derek Adina and Jennifer Alfonso. Unfortunately, all of it is inadmissible hearsay because it all comes from what Jennifer tells him. And it's our position that none of these statements that Jennifer made are, are subject to any of the hearsay exception, exceptions uh, recognized under the law. Um, things about, as Mr. Zonkin referred to, him being the, the uh, her being the man in the relationship and, and, and Mr. Medina being the woman. Allegations of drug use, Ms. Alfonso's alleged admissions to using drugs, uh, Ms. Alfonso's admissions allegedly of, 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 quote, abusing Derek Medina. All of these things are great, but again, they're, they're statements being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. So certainly, if Mr. Bates takes the witness stand, we're going to be objecting left and right to hearsay. So, you know, unless the defense can proffer some exception that this, that, that this court can, can can hang its hat on, none of this should come in is our position. And with respect to the drug use, Judge, we would go back to our initial motion in limine, but we, we do believe that before any evidence of drug use can come in, there has to be a foundation laid. Judge, given the fact that I haven't had my chance to, my, to do my due diligence, but off the top of my head, and I will say that given the fact that um, who was the initial aggressor, given the fact that that's become an issue, I'll, I'll, I'll quote Berkeley State, which is actually in the government's own motion, which says evidence of a decedent's violent character is admissible if an issue exists as to whether the victim was the first aggressor. So that's the, that is the, uh, that's the relevance and with, with, with respect to the hearsay exception, it, it absolutely goes to her state of mind. Mm -hmm. She clearly is indicated, judge, this is a self-defense case. She's claiming I am the man, I abuse him. That's what I do. That's her state of mind. That's what she's professing to Mr. Bates. And it goes to the core of our defense. This is a battered spouse self-defense case. Unfortunately. Can I see the deposition of Mr. Bates? Do we have that? We have it there. Would you like it? Yes, please. We have his formal statement as well as his deposition statement, Judge. If I may, prosecute, there's no notes or anything. I don't think anything in there. Judge, we did underline some things. Is that okay? If, if the Here, there's, state here's doesn't have an objection, I can ignore those as yeah. long as there's no work product included. I'll make sure this is the right No one. notes. This is not the right person. Do you have There's actually two statements that Mr. Bates has given, one to the police, one to a defense investigator. I just inquire as to which one is being well, I can give the deposition transcript. That's what she asked for. Here. That's the yeah. Okay. I'll May I judge? It. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Just give me a quick moment.
The court has now had an opportunity to read the deposition transcript of Mr. Bates. Anything further, defense? Judge, um, <clears throat> give me just one second. Yes. Judge, um, we would be relying on a holding in Munoz v. State, which is a third district case. Do you have a site? 45 Southern 3rd, 954. Can you just give me a moment? I apologize. I would have gotten it's cited, it's cited in my motion, Judge. I'll okay. I, I still would like to pull it up. What it says there, Judge, and, 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 and what we want the court to also consider is, is on page 2, the first paragraph, under head notes two, um, about halfway down where it starts, it says, are you there, Judge? No, I'm pulling it up right now. I'll wait. Southern Third 954, okay, I got it. On page I, I don't, I, obviously I'm looking at Westlaw as it is, so page, I'll read just, it. a I'll page read number. It. I'll read it. Just give me a page number. Page uh, like, two? No, I need I'm sorry, Judge. a citation page. page number. I think it's 46. Or just give me, what head note is it near? Head note two. Generally, evidence? Is that how it starts? Generally, evidence regarding? No, Judge. It starts there are distinctions and evidentiary requirements between reputation evidence and evidence of specific acts. All right, just give me a moment.
Okay. So obviously, Judge, we believe that the statement falls in under subsection 3 of 90.803 under Florida statute, the then existing mental, uh, the state of mind of, 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 the, of the declarant. I think it's clearly a provision that, 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 that falls under there. Her statement to, to Bruce Bates clearly shows her state of mind, which is, I'm the man in the relationship. I'm the, you know, I, if anybody, if anything, I abuse him. That goes to her perception of their relationship. That's her state of mind. Okay. State? Judge, I, I disagree. That's not actually what state of mind means. State of mind would be more like uh, a statement as to what victim is feeling. For example, the text messages that she exchanged with Ms. Barry that have been put into evidence through counsel's... Uh, or maybe put into evidence. Right. Uh, where she was saying, I feel like I want to explode. I feel like ripping his face off. That would be more state of mind. These are state of alleged facts. <laughs> That's not the same thing. Um, so counsel is certainly misconstruing, I believe, that particular hearsay exception. Okay. As the court reads Munoz v. State 45 Southern 3rd 954, which is a third DCA case from 2010, I find that uh, based upon the court's reading of Mr. Bates's deposition testimony um, that it is distinguishable from the facts uh, in, mis in the Munoz case. In those cases, both reputation and specific bad um, uh, specific bad acts uh, or character evidence, certain character evidence um, related to the alleged victim in that case uh, were um, prohibited because the it, while certain character evidence is admissible, the predicate must be that the defendant must establish that he was aware of it. These conversations between Mr. Bates and Miss Alfonso allegedly occurred at a Denny's that Mr. Bates um, frequented. These were conversations that are hearsay. Um, they are not reputation evidence. They are not evidence of bad acts. Um, and so at this time, unless the defense can lay a specific foundation that Mr. Medina, at the time of this incident, was aware of these conversations, um, they will not be permitted. With all due respect, we'd ask for time to research this issue. We received this motion to eliminate this morning. I've, a substantial amount of my opening argument was predicated on Mr. Bates' statements. I'd ask for time to do my due diligence. Judge Respectfully denied this issue was actually raised at the Arthur hearing two years ago, and the court's ruling was the same at that time. But you admitted it at the Arthur hearing. No, I did not. I, it was the same ruling at the Arthur hearing. Respectfully, Judge, hearsay is admissible in Arthur hearings. I believe I, I can pull the transcript. At, the, at this time, the court is making that ruling. Let's move on to this, the state's next motion. Hold on, Judge, if I may, just lay the record. The court's prohibiting us from making a statement. Here, here's kind of wh where we are, Judge. The declarant, the person that made the statement, is deceased. She made the statement to Bruce Bates. We believe it clearly falls under the, uh, the exception under 90.803 her then existing state of mind, her perception, please judge. Right, you can lay your record. Right, her perception as to how the relationship was, uh, her feelings on the relationship, her mental perception of the relationship because he asks her, is he beating you? She goes, no, I'm the man in the relationship. That's clearly a reflection of her state of mind. And given the fact that we are in a self-defense battered spouse case, judge, you're substantially prohibiting my ability to defend my client when we believe, and I know the court differs from us, but we believe the, this is clearly one of the exceptions under the hearsay exception. And I will also add to the court's ruling that under 90.803, it is to a time and place that is relevant to the facts of this case. And in this case, number one, Mr. Bates indicates he's not even sure when they occurred um, and in relationship to the incident. And so that makes it even more irrelevant to the facts of this case well, Judge, with and the state of mind of uh, Ms. Alfonso. Well, Judge, respectfully, Judge, it's our position that he was a victim of abuse during the entirety 
of the marriage, and we are going to have testimony from family members that will elicit that. So the spatial position as to when this statement was made, we believe is irrelevant if it falls under the time that they were together. So noted, the court has ruled. Okay, let's go on to the state's next motion, please. Which one would you like to raise? Judge, we can uh, handle the <coughs> Mr. Fantagrassi's motion. And then okay, and the court has had an opportunity over the lunch break to read Mr. Fantagrassi's deposition. Judge, just uh, basically as we laid out the motion, there's several issues that we have. Number one, the, the foundation of the Alpha PVP, that's, I think the court has already ruled that that has to be laid first. But yes. I just wanted to make that a part of the record uh, because that's really all his testimony relates to. Number two, um, it's our position that Mr. Frantagrossi's testimony admission in, on page 34 of his deposition that all of his answers are essentially based upon studies of drugs that are not chemically similar than the drug which is alleged to have been at issue in this case, which the defense is, I presume, going to be attempting to admit, perhaps. Um, he, he concedes that none of his opinions are based upon that particular drug, and so we believe that Where specifically on page 34 do you say that? I see where he says on page 34 that uh, the studies, there are no studies on alpha PVP specifically on humans. Correct, Judge. In, in the preceding paragraphs, when, he, when I asked him about, Judge, in the preceding paragraph, that final question was essentially a culmination of what started on, I believe it was about pages 30 or 31, when I asked him, so the opinions you testified here in terms of the effect on human behavior, you would expect to see on alpha, based on alpha PVP, I'm, I'm looking at page, on the bottom of page 31, Judge. It will re really be based, accurate to say that's primarily based upon the fact that it's similar to other drugs for which studies are available, but not specifically as to alpha PVP. So he, he's essentially, in that very long-winded answer he gives subsequent to that, uh, not disagreeing with that premise that it's based upon similarity, but not identical, being identical. So we don't feel that that makes his testimony relevant under 401. We would also note, with respect to his opinions as a pharmacologist, he testifies regarding the various effects of alpha PVP, and this is also identical testimony that Ms. Klein questioned Dr. Logan on in his deposition during, I believe, our second week of trial during jury selection. And Dr. Logan essentially admitted in his deposition that pharmacology and toxicology have significant overlaps. So to the extent that Dr. Logan is going to be providing opinions on the alleged effects of alpha PVP, again, if the defense gets that far and laying a foundation, we would submit that having both of these individuals testify would be cumulative. Okay. Would the defense like to be heard? Doc, could I just add one thing since I took Dr. Logan's deposition, Judge? Yes, you may. And that is, is that I asked Dr. Logan what he has been qualified as an expert in, and he specifically said um, the drugs, toxicology, and their effects, okay? He discussed in his deposition the writings that he's done, because I asked him about them, his published works on the effect of drugs on the body and on a person. So the defense has put forth an expert in the behavioral uh, effects of the alpha PVP, which is exactly what the only thing that they want to put Walter Frantigrassi on for. In addition, Judge, in part two of Dr. Logan's deposition that we did during lunch, I then went through with him everything that was asked of Dr. Frantigrassi about the lack of studies, about the effect, every effect that Dr. Fantagrassi testified to, Dr. Logan was able to confirm that in fact he agrees that those would be the effects. And so it is with that also that it was cumulative. I'm sorry, Mr. Dunn, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just would the defense like to be heard? Sure, Judge. I have a master's in pharmacology and toxicology and did two separate applications for Would you like to hear about the relevant? Would you like to make a position about the relevance? Under the impression that we had to lay a predicate to be able to, you know, 
by this evidence. So now the prosecution is saying that if we lay the predicate, they're looking to limit. I'm just trying. I'm just That's trying to my get understanding. Right. Yes. Because, like I said before, Judge, I got these at nine in the morning. We started court at nine thirty, and I really haven't had any time to really do my due diligence because, like I said, this is something that was emailed to us this morning. Um, I would ask for a 30-minute recess for me to research these issues, Judge. You have 15 minutes. Okay. Tell the jurors uh, 15 minutes.